Hey everyone. In honor of October, I'd like to spend our time today reading a scary story entitled The Curse of the Casts. This is a classic whodunit story where we'll encounter frights around every corner as we answer the question, what is the scariest cast in all of C++? Join me now as we embark on our adventure. This story is dedicated to our friends ConstCast, DynamicCast, and Boost Lexical Cast. While they don't appear in this story as main characters, they deserve our fear and respect. Here's what our journey has in store. In chapter one, we'll set the tone and establish some themes that will recur throughout our tale by discussing a cast that's not that scary. In chapter two, we'll discuss a cast that feels scary on its surface, but ultimately can be done easily and without undefined behavior. In chapter three, we'll discuss a cast that feels like the scariest cast you can imagine, and we'll see the terrifying way it can be implemented legally in C++. But finally, in chapter four, we'll learn that the scariest cast of all was the one we knew all along. Without further ado, chapter one. Let's say I have a function that looks like this. It's a function template that takes two parameters of the same type. Now, I want to call this function with two objects, base and derived. And as the name suggests, let's assume the type of derived inherits publicly from the type of base. Now, when I call this function template without providing any explicit template arguments, the compiler has the task of figuring out what t is. It looks at the first parameter and sees that t must be base. Then it looks at the second parameter and sees that t must be derived. Those two types are not the same, so type deduction fails. This code doesn't compile. You've probably run into this before when using stdmax, for example. It doesn't matter if the arguments can implicitly convert to each other. For the purposes of type deduction, they have to match exactly. So this is easy to fix, right? We can just static cast our derived to base and force the conversion to happen, and now everything works. But I have a bone to pick with this code. Derived to base is an implicit conversion that can happen without a cast, but we just wrapped it in a static cast. Static cast can do this conversion for us, but it can also do more. It can call explicit constructors and explicit conversion operators. I don't want that to happen here. I just want to give derived a little nudge to get it to perform its implicit conversion without running the risk of accidentally performing a conversion that's supposed to be explicit. This comes down to an important engineering tenet called the principle of least power. You should always choose the least powerful tool available that can get the job done. It's the reason I wouldn't cut a sandwich in half with a chainsaw. It's the reason I don't hang out on my computer logged in as root. And it applies here too. Static cast is slightly too powerful for this conversion. How about if we write another cast and call it implicit cast that will only perform conversions that can be done implicitly. I know this name is an oxymoron because by writing this it's no longer implicit, but I think this is still a compelling use case for a tool like this. So how would we implement this? Well, it's beautifully simple. We don't actually have to do any converting. We just have our parameter be the destination type. And so the conversion happens as the user is calling the function. They get a nice error message at the call site if it doesn't work. Then we just return the converted value and we get a nice implicit move here. By the way, I'm omitting some details that would clutter up the screen. In real code, this function should be const expert, no except if u is no throw move constructible and no discard. So that's great. But what's up with this type identity thing? Well, this is a little trick that turns off type deduction for this function parameter. The reason is that I don't want you to be able to call this function without specifying a destination type. I mean, that wouldn't do anything useful. It would just return the value you pass in without converting it. So I want to prevent you from making that mistake. This type identity thing does that. But why? Well, type identity is what you might call a meta function, which is a function that, instead of operating on values, takes one or more types and returns one or more types. Type identity happens to return the same type you pass in. But what the compiler sees is that we have a meta function result as our parameter type, and that that result must be base, because we're passing in base. But in general, that tells the compiler nothing about you, saying, hey, I have this meta function, figure out what to pass in to get a base out would require the compiler to be able to figure out the inverse of your meta function. While that happens to be trivial here, in general, it's not possible, and the compiler just won't do it. It just says, well, I'll have to figure out you some other way. In this case, there is no other way, so it falls on the user to explicitly pass it in. Note that type identity t is an alias for this longer syntax, and the rule of thumb is that if you have a double colon after a type in your parameter type, that parameter won't be able to contribute to type deduction. So here's our implicit cast. It's the least powerful cast that actually does anything, and as such, it's one of my favorites. Chapter two. Here's a famous piece of code from Quake 3 Arena. I've tweaked it very slightly, but kept the spirit, including the comments in the real code. This function uses some dark magic to approximate one over square root of x, which is useful for normalizing vectors and stuff like that. It has this strange implementation that was faster on the hardware of the time than doing it the more obvious way. 
That's no longer super true, especially as some ISAs have dedicated instructions to do exactly this, but this is still a fascinating artifact from the history of our field. The special sauce is here. Notice that the author is warning us of the evils ahead, another nice literary trope for our story. By the way, this was C code originally, but these are essentially C++ reinterpret casts, so let's rewrite them that way. Basically what we're doing here is exploiting some details of how IEEE floats are represented in memory. We want to do some bit twiddling operations, but you can't do those on floats. So first we reinterpret the bits in our float as though it were an integer. Then we shift our integer and subtract it from a magic number. I agree with the comment on this. I've never actually studied what this is doing or why this works, but it's something cool. And then we convert our integer back into a float. So this is pretty bizarre and amazing, and I encourage you to go learn more about this code. But unfortunately, I have to be that guy and point out that it has undefined behavior in both C and C++ actually. The reason is a little outside of our scope today, but here are some terms to Google. Essentially, with a couple of special exceptions, you're just not allowed to refer to the same memory through pointers of different types at the same time. So how do we do this? I mean, the whole point of a systems language is to have low-level control like this, and it's clearly useful to be able to do. I mean, here's a use case. So let's write a cast that I'll call puncast, because what we're doing here is called type punning, and we'll implement it in a way that doesn't suffer from UB. So how can we do that? Well, one way you might think of is using a union. If we create a union that stores T and U in the same memory, and then write our T in and read it back out as a U, that seems like it should work. But it actually doesn't. It works in C, but in C++ you are not allowed to do this. In C++, the only union member you're allowed to read from is the last one you wrote to. So this implementation has undefined behavior. The reason, again, is strict aliasing, where we're not allowed to have two views of different types into the same memory at the same time. So we need to somehow do this cast in a way where we never treat the same memory location as two different types. One way to do that is with memcopy. This function literally copies the bytes from one place to another, but we never have two pointers with different types pointing at the same memory location. Now, this is somewhat dangerous to do. We need to be sure the types are the same size and there aren't any copy constructors we're bypassing by doing this. You could also use Fine or Concepts to constrain this template instead of static asserting. But this code has one more problem. It can't be constexpr. The reason is that memcopy is not a constexpr function, so our pun cast will never be able to execute at compile time. Before C++20, we would have been stuck here. There was no way to type pun at compile time. But C++20 introduced a tool called bitcast in the standard library that is magic. It is defined as behaving like our memcopy code, except it magically works at compile time too. It requires special compiler support to implement it. But luckily, it makes our puncast a one-liner, also just kind of redundant. We could have just used bitcast at our call site back in our inverse square root function. So bitcast, while being powerful and low level, is not scary. It's explicitly blessed by the C++ standard, and it's an irreplaceable tool in our toolbox. Now it's time to meet a contender for the most evil cast of all. I certainly can't imagine a cast more evil than one that takes your class's private data members or member functions unless you treat them as public. This would utterly destroy your ability to reason about your code, since you would have no way to trust that any object in your program hadn't had its internal invariance tampered with. But would you believe me if I said that we can write public cast legally in C++ without undefined behavior? Watch and be terrified. To motivate this, let's say that we have a class C with a member X that we'd like to access from the outside. Note that X is private because the default visibility of members and classes is private. So this whole trick is going to hinge on this interesting quote from the C++ standard that says that when you're declaring an explicit template instantiation, the normal checks that prevent you from accessing private stuff outside of a class are turned off. So you can refer to, for example, names that are normally private as long as you're doing it while declaring an explicit instantiation. So to see what this means, let's try to create a pointer to member variable that points at C's X member. Doing this outside the class leads to an error because X is private and its name is inaccessible. So that's what we'd expect. Now instead, let's create a class template that just takes in a value as a non-type template parameter and stores it in a static member. Now, according to that quote from the standard, if we explicitly instantiate this class template, we are allowed to name C's X member while doing so. Access checks are turned off in this moment, and we can just get a pointer to this private member, no problem. So are we done? Well, not quite. We can't actually use this explicit instantiation very easily. If we want to use it, we have to spell out its name, and that's going to involve mentioning C double colon X. But when we do, on this line, we're no longer inside the explicit instantiation declaration, so this mention of X gives us an error. So we're not quite home free yet. 
What do we do? Well, the evil trick we're going to use is that right here, when we're writing down this pointer inside of our val class, we are also going to write it down somewhere else that we can retrieve later without needing to mention the actual member. I'm going to call that place public cast. There's going to be another class template that has a static member inside, but notice that this static member is not const. You'll see why. The class template is also going to have a special key as a template parameter that I'm calling secret that we'll use while instantiating val to smuggle the pointer out and we use the same key later on to look the pointer up. Now let's extend val to take in a secret from the outside, and in the instantiation I'll pass in a secret called CX secret. And now, here's the big reveal. While we're initializing val's m member, oops, we're also going to assign m to the static member of public cast. This might look kind of trippy, but it's just a chained assignment. Remember that in C++, assignments usually return a reference to the thing you just assigned to. So we are assigning capital M to public cast static M and then constructing val static M from that. This is why public cast M is not const, so we can assign to it in the middle of this expression. So we now have a pointer to a private data member inside an instantiation of public cast. And all we need to do to get it is use the secret to look up the right instantiation. Here's how it looks. I'm not saying it's pretty, but we use our public cast template using our key to grab the instantiation we want. And then we use the dot star operator on an instance of C to actually get a reference to its X member. We also have to pass in the type of the pointer to X. I couldn't think of a way to avoid this, but let me know if you can. But otherwise, here's our public cast. Our val class might be better named something like access since it's required for getting access to the private member in the first place. And here's the complete usage. This technique is fully legal and it works for both private member data and private member functions. Now, should you do this in your code? Obviously not. As I already mentioned, doing this makes your code impossible to reason about because it means you can no longer trust that any of your objects that we're trying to maintain invariants still have those invariants intact. This cast is deeply evil, but by the same token, I would argue it's not actually that scary. First of all, no one's doing this. I've never actually seen this in real code. And even if you decided you needed it, look at the syntax. It'll take so long to type that you'll have plenty of time to rethink your life in the meantime. No, it may be the most evil, but it's not the scariest. The scariest cast is not the ugly one that goes out of its way to explicitly break your code. Instead, it's the simple, unassuming one we've known all along. The scariest cast in C++ is the C-style cast. Who would have thought? I mean, look at that nice syntax. It also applies to this syntax, which is exactly equivalent when it's used with one argument. Now, when I was first learning C++, and I was wondering whether to use C-style casts or the more verbose C++-style casts, I heard a lot of advice like this. Oh, we should use the C++ casts. They're more explicit. They're easier to grep. That's all true, but it understates things. I don't remember anyone ever telling me this, that C-style casts will break your code, but it's true. And I'd like to talk about this as we bring our scary story to its heart-pounding conclusion. So remember from chapter one when we talked about the principle of least power. The problem with C-style casts is that they are incredibly powerful, dangerously so. First of all, let's just walk through what they do. The way C-style casts are specified is that the compiler will try a bunch of different kinds of casts until one of them makes sense for the operand and the type between the parentheses. Here's what they try in order. The first thing they try is const cast. This should already scare you. If you accidentally forget a const in the type between the parentheses, C-style cast will not complain. They will just cast away your const. If a plain const cast doesn't work, C-style cast will try to act like an extra powerful static cast. The extra powers are that you can cast an object to a private base class. That's bonkers, if you ask me. It means that trying to do encapsulation using private inheritance is just useless because users can just sidestep it using the easiest cast to spell in the whole language. Next, if that doesn't work, it tries uber static cast followed by const cast. So you, you can cast to a private base and cast away const in the same expression. Lastly, if none of that worked, C style cast is like, well, I guess you meant reinterpret cast. Or actually, maybe you want to reinterpret cast and then also cast away const. So that's really powerful. But is your code really going to break? Yes. Watch. I have a struct s, and it's inheriting publicly from base and also some interface ifoo. And let's assume that base is four bytes. Let's also assume I have a function called p that just prints the address that's in the pointer you give it. So let me create an s and just print its address. There it is. Now I'd like to print s, but converted to its public base class ifoo. This is actually a perfect spot for implicit cast from chapter one, since this conversion just needs a little nudge. It doesn't need the full power of an explicit conversion. And note the address when I do this. 
Since base is four bytes and ifu is second in the inheritance list, the address of the ifu subobject of s is actually four bytes after the start of the s object itself. The compiler understands this and performs this little offset for us when we convert an s star to an ifu star. The same thing happens with static cast. Staticast understands the inheritance relationship between S and IFU and knows that to properly convert, we need to do a little pointer offset. Now look what happens when we reinterpret cast. It does not do this offset for us. This is a good example of the difference between Staticast and reinterpret cast. Staticast says, do this pointer conversion within the semantics of the language, whereas reinterpret cast just says, pretend this pointer has this other type. And that's the wrong thing here, and it's not safe to use the pointer you get out. Now let's try C style cast. C style cast actually gets the right answer here. It behaves like static cast in this case because it can. But now let's look at what happens if we refactor our code so that S no longer inherits from ifu. I still have the same S object, same address. Now our implicit cast and static cast both stop compiling as they should. It no longer makes sense to convert an S star to an ifu star. Those two types are now unrelated. If we remove ifu as a base class of S, anywhere we've relied on them being related, we need to fix our code. And by using less powerful casts like implicit cast and static cast, we now get a to-do list from the compiler of all the spots we need to fix. Reinterpret cast is still broken just like before and nothing has changed. Look what happens with our C style cast though. Static cast no longer makes sense here, so C style cast now searches further down its list and it falls back to being a reinterpret cast. Note that the address is wrong just like the line above. When we broke the inheritance relationship, our C style cast silently changed meaning and didn't tell us about it. If we're refactoring a large code base, how are we even going to find this? I think this one example should be enough to convince anyone on earth to never use C style casts ever again. And yet, even I still find myself tempted to use them. And it's because the syntax is so convenient. The other casts are so verbose and explicit, which I think would be great design for calling out ugly operations in your code with ugly names, except that we have this other tool that's cleaner, easier to use, and far more dangerous right at our fingertips. And so it was that the C-style cast, the most powerful of all the casts, with the easiest and most tempting syntax, who gleefully casts away your const, who insidiously breaks your pointer cast, and who laughs at the light of private inheritance, was therefore the scariest cast of all. The End